do that. Okay. Right. We'll, get, we'll get started this morning. Uh, I would remind you uh, that this first hour, uh, this is a great way to spend a cozy day at home listening to tax law and tax preparation. Ha ha. <laughs> uh, this first hour, typically when we do this, it's a four hour event. It's a, very interactive, usually from nine to one with lunch. Uh, I have attempted, and now all I'm saying is attempted to digest as much of this as possible into one hour of content. So there likely will not be much room for, for Q&A during this first hour. The second hour from one to two will be 100% Q&A. It will be highly interactive. It will not be content unless the content is necessary to respond to your questions. But that said, <clears throat> excuse me, we do need your questions. So as Becky mentioned earlier, if you would uh, write in the chat uh, any questions that you have as we go along, or uh, Kate, who is our receptionist, uh, who's on the call here also, she has posted my phone number and my email. Uh, it's gary at tarrantbaptist.org, or you can send it to front desk at tarrantbaptist.org, any questions that you have. And uh, I can answer lots of questions that don't get asked, but I would prefer to answer the ones that do get asked that, that come from you. So those that we get between right this moment and one o'clock this afternoon will be at the top of the queue when we do the Q&A this afternoon. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, one thing that I would encourage you to do is to, to take copious notes uh, in order to be able to interact with the call. I hope that everybody can make it this afternoon at one uh, because uh, like I said, we're not gonna have much interaction right now. It's gonna be mostly content. Uh, I'm going to use a lot of terminology that most, most of us don't live with every day. Uh, some of us maybe only pass by it once a year when we do our federal income tax return, but I'll try to spell things out as specifically as possible. Uh, I live in a family of educators that speak in acronyms and uh, I, can, I can talk about AGA and MAGA and all that kind of stuff all day long and you would look at me strangely. So I'm going to say adjusted gross income and modified adjusted gross income. So if anybody gets a weird look on their face, I know that I'm not communicating well, all right? Okay, well, um, let's start with the word of prayer. Uh, Terry, would you lead us, Terry Colley, would you lead us a brief word of prayer? Be glad to, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing for us, Lord. And Father, as, <laughs> as sometimes as stressful as taxes are for us, Lord, we know that it's something that we as good citizens of our country need to be involved in. We need to pay our taxes. So Lord, give us the wisdom to do what we need to do. Uh, we ask your guidance and wisdom for Gary as he speaks to us today. Lord, bless us, bless our families in Jesus name, amen. Thank you, Terry. All right, all of you got a, a uh, minister's tax seminar outline uh, it sort of looks like this. It says Minister's Tax Center is one page. Uh, it's about the February 11 event. I hope you got it. If you didn't, it's not critical, uh, but it's just an, sort of an overview of what we're going to be talking about uh, this morning. And the first section has to do with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, some of you may have heard about that. That's the tax law that was passed in December of 2017. And it is the tax law that we will be living with unless it's changed until December 31, 2025. So on January 1, 2026, everything goes back to what it was prior to 2018, unless uh, there are modifications. Uh, I, I think that there will be modifications or they will ratify much of the content of this law uh, so that it'll become the law going forward starting in 2026. But that's the one that we're living under right now. I just wanted to highlight a few of the, the most common aspects of it. Uh, there are seven different tax rates. Most of us are in the 10, the 12, or the 22% rate. If you're in the 35 or 37% rate, I wanna have a private conversation with you and figure out how you got there. Uh, most people make millions that, that get into that level. Uh, but those are one of the tax rates and it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bracketed system that it's 10%. And most of the stuff that I'm gonna say today, folks, uh, has to do with married filing jointly. I know that there are singles, there are uh, heads of household, 
and, and so forth. But most of the comments that I will be making today will have to do with married filing jointly because that's where most of you live. And so for instance, the tax rate up to for 2020 uh, is 10% up to a taxable income of 19,750, which means that if your taxable income is in that bracket that you pay 10% of that as tax. And then the next bracket is from 19,751 to 80,250. It means you pay that $1,975 plus 12% of everything over the 19,750. And I want going up the bracket, but I think you understand the concept is that uh, the 10% rate applies to practically all of us. Most of us are probably at least the 12% bracket. Some of, us, some of us may actually be in the 22% bracket. But uh, one of the advantages of TurboTax and some of the online options uh, is that uh, they will compute for you an effective tax rate. It's not 10, it's not 12, it's not 22, because it's a hybrid of the different rates that you pay at based on your, your taxable income bracket. And so you might have an effective tax rate that's say 18% uh, or something because of the combination of the, the amounts that you pay. Now, uh, one of the aspects that was a huge change in the Tax Cuts and Job Act was the standard deduction. Uh, you may remember when for a married couple that was $12,400. Well, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was changed. It was practically doubled. It was doubled, and actually right now in 2020, the amount's 24800 not 12400 but $24,800. You say, wow, the government's being really generous. Well, when they did that, they took away your standard deduction per, per individual that's on your tax return. So if you're a family of four, you lost $4,100 for each person listed on your tax return as a standard deduction. They, it, 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 you don't have that anymore, but you do have a high standard deduction, but you don't have, I'm sorry, you don't have the personal exemption of 4,100, but you do have the higher standard deduction. Now, if there's anybody on this call that's, that's uh, over 65, guess what? You get a bonus. Uh, it's $1,300 additional uh, to the 24,800 in 2020 for each uh, person on your tax return uh, of the couple. If, if both of you are over 65, you add $2,600 to the 24,800. That's, that's quite a bit, that's quite a bit up there. Now, why is this significant? The standard deduction and the personal exemption going away is because prior to this tax law change, uh, easily uh, 30 to 35% of Americans itemized their taxes on Schedule A, which included medical contributions, sales tax, property tax, casualty losses, and, and uh, unreimbursed employee business expenses. All of those things could be itemized. Uh, in 2020, uh, probably about 12% of Americans will itemize. Everybody else will take the standard deduction. And so that is a tremendous shift. So the folks that give to your church, most of them can no longer itemize and use their charitable contributions as a tax deduction, but they do get a much higher standard deduction that covers those things. So basically for a couple under 65, if your standard deduction of 24,800 is greater then your cumulative itemized potential deductions like contributions, taxes, medical expenses, and so forth, you're gonna take the standard deduction because that's greater. And like I said, probably up, up to, excuse me, up to 90% of the people that, that are actually on uh, the new tax returns uh, will do the standard deduction. Now, uh, one of the things that it did, it doesn't imperil us that much here in North Texas uh, however it could because property taxes are high in Texas, uh, but your property taxes are now limited to $10,000 even if you do itemize. So if you have a, a tax bill on your property, your ad valorem taxes is greater than $10,000, you're limited to 10,000. Uh, the folks like in California and New York that have, have uh, much higher values, pay a lot of property tax, that really hurts folks like that that are limited to the $10,000, even if you itemize. And if you itemize, that's, that's not an issue. Uh, 
one of the things that uh, we are able to do as ministers uh, with a housing allowance is that we can deduct if we itemize the interest on our home mortgage up to a $750,000 amount uh, and also excluded as ministerial housing allowance. But again, if you do not itemize, if you take the standard deduction of 24,800, uh, that really doesn't impact you that much. Uh, when this new tax bill first came out, uh, you, if you were going to itemize and get any benefit from medical expenses, it had to exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income. But since then, it's dropped back down to 7.5%, uh, and that's where it's going to stay. So it has to exceed 7.5% of your AGI, your adjusted gross income, to be an itemized deduction, again, if you itemize. Now, we're going to be talking today about deductions, adjustments, and credits. Uh, there, those are three different categories of amounts that come off of your income or come off your taxes. If you have to choose between a deduction, an adjustment, or your credit, many times you probably want a credit. Do you know why? I'll answer that question. Is because a credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax bill. If you owe $5,000 federal income tax, it actually reduces it dollar for dollar for a credit. And we're gonna to touch lightly on a number of those credits that are options that some of you may not even be an option and you qualify for it. Hopefully most of your, your tax software is going to, to ask you the right questions to help you know that. Uh, but if it doesn't, uh, just be aware that there are some credits out there that, that you can take advantage of. Um, one of the things that some of the Congress wanted to change with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act at the end of 2017 was to make it harder to save in a 401k or a 403b retirement plan or an individual retirement account. And uh, fortunately, uh, in, in all their wisdom, they said, no, we're not going to mess with that. And so they've actually done a few things that I'll mention later that uh, were more advantageous for those types of plans. Uh, because that's one of the greatest benefits that we can get as Americans. I uh, wanted to mention a few of the recent developments and the book that, that I asked you to download, I wanted to go ahead and mention this, the Minister's Tax and Financial Guide. Uh, this was in the constant contact email that you've got. Uh, it's about 190 pages of quality reading for bedtime. Uh, but if, if you, if you want to download this or load it, uh, load it up on your computer, uh, you, you can read that. But as much as anything, I wanted to direct you to churchexcel.org, churchexcel.org. If, Kate, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Churchexcel.org. Uh, that is the free version of the website for Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability that uh, Tarrant Baptist belongs to, as, long as, as well as 2,500 other Christian organizations in America. Uh, they have some great resources on there. This minister's tax uh, manual or direct, the, it's called a financial guide is, is by far one of the finest products that you will find in the marketplace for this purpose. There are other tax manuals that are put out, uh, but they get a little bit more in the weeds than this does. But this highlights a lot of really good information that you'll find very, very helpful, okay? Uh, I want so page one is actually page one in that manual. Uh, if, if you want to look there, if you don't, I'm just going to highlight a few things. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to say to you that's just for 2020, okay? So don't overlook this. Even if you do not itemize, you can still adjust off up to $300 in cash contributions that you made in 2020, even if you take the standard deduction and do not itemize. That is part of the CARES Act. That was the pandemic bill that was passed uh, early in the spring. And so that's on uh, Form 1040, line 10B, on your 1040, line 10B. So if you gave money to your church last year, which I pray that all of you did, uh, and you're not itemizing, you can still adjust off. There you go. It's not a deduction, but it is an adjustment off the top of your income that you can do on the Form 1040. I'll go ahead and give you some other good news. Uh, the C, what they call the CAA, the, the newest bill that was passed, uh, consolidated tax bill that was passed in December 27th of 2020, allows you to adjust off for 2021 up to 
So go ahead and keep giving to your church, even if you don't itemize. And when you file your 2021 tax return, you'll be able to adjust off $600. Uh, one of the other recent developments that you need to know about, uh, all, of, all of us, at least those of us that are, that are, are closer to the, the mid-60s especially, uh, if not before, are aware of what's RMD, Required Minimum Distributions. Uh, this is a recent development under the SECURE Act. You may want to write that down, the SECURE Act, S-E-C-U-R-E, -E, if you want to go back and research this for yourself. But prior to the issuance last year of the SECURE Act, you were required by the time that you were 70 and a half to begin taking annual required minimum distributions from your 403B or 401k retirement account. If you didn't take it, the penalty was 50%, five zero percent of the amount that you should have taken and did not. So uh, the SECURE Act, what it actually did, it bumped it up to age 72. And so now you're not required to take anything out as far as a required minimum dis distribution until age 72. It bumped it up from 70 and a half to age 72. And in addition to that, to complicate the issue, the CARES Act uh, actually suspended all required minimum distributions in 2020. And I think the new bill that just came out also may have suspended, suspended I'm not sure, RMDs for 2021, but I know it did for 2020. And so that, that's a big uh, news item that you need to know if you're at the stage of life that you need to, to start drawing down uh, your required minimum distributions. Now, the next thing that, that I, would, I would mention to you uh, is the, uh, the, a piece of legislation that, that actually was introduced uh, in February of last year. It hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, but for some of you folks, this is really going to be a, uh, an important issue. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more as we get there. But when you were licensed, ordained, or commissioned, uh, you had an option it basically in the first two years after you were licensed, ordained, or commissioned as a minister to opt out of Social Security. In other words, you could fill out the form 4361 and tell the federal government, I do not want to participate in Social Security. The only grounds for doing that is a moral religious objection, if you read the front of the form, uh, to receiving uh, public support payments from any uh, revenue or income that you have from ministerial sources. And that means you don't want Medicare, you don't want Social Security, you don't want disability, you don't want the government to pay you any of those things based on your ministerial source income. That's the form 4361. If you've been ordained a while, the boat has already left the dock. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, even if you could sign that affidavit. Uh, many times I have had young men in my office that have said, uh, an older pastor said, it's going to cost me a lot of money to pay Social Security at the self-employed rate. I'm going to opt out of Social Security. My response is that's fraud. That is disingenuous, is lack of integrity. If you don't sincerely have a moral religious objection to receiving public support payments based on your ministerial source income. All of that said, there have been a couple times over the last 20 years, and there are very limited windows when you have been able to opt back into the social security system if you decided that you really were not as sure about the affidavit as what you were at the time that you signed it. Uh, there's never been any guarantee that you'd be offered an opportunity to get back in. Even if you did, if you opted out, you had to make a lot of back payments for, for social security that you did not pay. The bill that was introduced in February of last year that's still languishing in Congress would allow you to opt back in without any penalties. That is very significant, folks. A window like that has never existed before. So if you opted out for, for the reasons that I mentioned and you want to come back in, just stay tuned. Uh, ECFA is monitoring that. A lot of nonprofits are monitoring that. If, if that should be true, it'd be a unique opportunity for ministers that opted out of Social Security to opt back into it, okay? Um, 
Let me see, where do we go from there? The next category is special uh, tax provisions for clergy. If you could uh, look with me on that, you don't actually have a handout on it, but I'm gonna hit a few points. Uh, things that apply to those of us that are ordained ministers uh, that don't apply to anybody else. We are a strange animal, folks, under the Internal Revenue Code. Those of us that are licensed, ordained, or commissioned, in case your church hasn't reminded you of that, let me just tell you that the government, the federal government, thinks that, that we, we qualify in ways, uh, file our taxes differently than anybody else under the code. But some of the things that I would mention is the exclusion for income tax purposes of the housing allowance and the fair rental value of a congregation owned parsonage provided rent free to clergy, okay? The ministerial housing allowance has been under attack in the last few years on the subject of lawsuits. I'm not going into the details, but twice in the last seven years, it's been upheld by the court system, the federal court system. Uh, and it goes back a long ways and there are forces out there, basically atheistic organizations that have tried to get it done away with uh, as not being a fair tax benefit for ministers. But if your church declares you a ministerial housing allowance and you use it on qualified housing expenses, that housing amount can be deduct, can be excluded from federal income taxation. It cannot be exempted from social security unless you opted out. So let's say that you have a $25,000 ministerial housing allowance declared by your church, okay? You don't have to pay income tax on that if you use it for qualified housing expenses, but if you're in the social security system, you still have to pay the 15.3% on that. So you don't escape the social security, you only escape the income tax. Now, there, there are limitations. Uh, there are three different, uh, three different levels, and you need to listen to all three of them, if you will, please. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the amount that your church declares in writing a resolution and the, the payments must be prospective. In other words, the payments must happen after the resolution is approved in writing by your church governance system. That could be a finance committee, a business meeting, your elder group, but it must be put in writing before the payments are actually made, okay? Or it's the amount that you actually spend or it's the fair rental value furnished plus utilities of your housing, okay? It is the lesser of those three. So if your church declares 25,000 in our example, and you only spend 23,000, you have to add 2,000 back to your income on line one of your form 1040. Now, if your church declares 25,000 and you spend 25,000, but the fair rental value furnished plus utilities is only 20,000, that is a limiting factor. And most ministers don't even think about that. They think, well, I spent so much money and the, the church approved it, so I can automatically exclude what I paid. It's usually not an issue because usually what you spent will be relatively equivalent or more than the fair rental value furnished plus utilities. But that is a limiting factor that came from a 2002 case with Rick Warren uh, you may remember that Rick was declaring a $100,000 housing allowance. And the Internal Revenue, of course, he was making $300,000, but the Internal Revenue said, uh, we don't think that that's possible. Rick says, you don't live in Southern California. And he said, it does cost a lot of money to live in Southern California like I live. And uh, he, he took them to issue and won. But in four days, the US Congress put the patch on it of limiting it to fair rental value furnished plus utilities. He actually was within the parameters of what was appropriate for the, the, the jurisdiction where he was, okay? So you do have those limitations. Just because fair rental value furnished plus utilities is in there doesn't mean you can do that. It's only hard dollars that you spend that you can potentially exclude for ministerial housing allowance purposes, okay? The second thing uh, under special tax provisions for clergy is exemption of clergy from self-employment tax under very limited circumstances. Uh, we, we talked about that with the form 4361. 
the treatment of clergy who do not elect social security exemption is self-employed as it concerns income from their ministerial services. Uh, we are self-employed folks. If you are a minister, if your church considers you a minister and you meet those criteria, you are ordained and you meet those criteria by, by leading worship, by doing what they call sacerdotal functions. If you have an administrative role in your church, you have to meet some or all of those criteria to qualify as a minister. But if you do, and you don't opt out of social security, it's 15.3%. You pay the employee as well as the employer portion of the social security. Uh, for most ministers, the 15.3% is the largest portion of their total tax bill. We typically pay a lot less income tax than we do federal than we do social security tax. You are not under FICA, you are under what's called SECA, the Self-Employment Contributions Act. It all goes in the same pot in Washington, but ministers are covered under SECA, S-E-C-A. Regular employees are covered under FICA, F-I-C-A. An ordained minister is never FICA. Now, there is, uh, there is not, not mandatory withholding of income tax from ministers. There are three different ways this can be handled. You, you don't have to have one penny taken out of your check if you don't want to for your tax obligations. The government does not require that. However, you're still gonna owe the money potentially. So you can do estimated tax payments and I suppose that some of you do that. There are four dates, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th and January 15th are the four dates. You download a, an estimated tax voucher from the irs.gov website and send in a check. That is one option. Most ministers uh, adopt the practice of voluntary deductions. And so they have that money taken out of their check by their church and they remit that on their behalf to the Internal Revenue Service or to the US Treasury. That's the easiest way to do it if you don't mind them getting your money every time you get paid. Estimated, obviously you can wait uh, and keep your money a little bit longer until those four dates come around. The other option is to have the church take money out and keep it in a reserve account for you and write you a check when those four times come around and then you write a check to the Internal Revenue Service. The concern that many ministers seem to have is, uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna have the money when those four dates come. So if you, if you want your administrative people to hold money back for you, they can keep it on file, so to speak, at your church and just give you a, a check to you. They don't send it to the government, they give it to you and then you remit it as an estimated uh, tax payment. Now, how do you keep out of a penalty situation with regarding the taxes? Uh, one of those uh, is, or the, the general rule is, you have to pay in the current year uh, at least, this is a minimum, at least 90% of your current year's tax obligation or 100% of your previous year's tax obligation. So what would be really easy, let's say that your total obligation for 2019 for your self-employment tax, social security and your income tax, let's say your whole bill were $8,000. How could you avoid a penalty in 2020? You can divide that $8,000 by four and send in one fourth of that amount on each of those four dates that I mentioned, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th and January 15th. That is a real straightforward, simple way uh, to do it right uh, if, if you want to do it that way. The other thing that I want to mention to you, and I get this question a lot, is, well, uh, do, do my administrative people show uh, my, my taxes as FICA on my W-2? This is a W-2. You should have gotten one of these by January 31. The difference for a minister is that every single penny that is taken out of your check, if you do vol voluntary deductions, uh, is it goes into the federal income tax withheld column, box two. You will never have anything under the Social Security, the Medicare, Social Security tips. None of those boxes are used. And when your administrative people file your 941 payroll report every quarter, they can never say that a minister paid FICA Social Security, you only pay federal income tax. And you say, well, I'm gonna have a Social Security obligation. Yes, you are. We're talking out of both sides of our mouth at the same time. 
but you can apply the money that you pay in to any tax that you owe, even though it's called federal income tax. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so th those are some of the things that make us special, <laughs> so to speak, if you will, as ministers. Uh, the next category there is uh, the biggest clergy tax mistakes that are made by congregations. Uh, one of the common things that happens is that there are things that are taxable for ministers that don't get on their W-2. And by the way, as ministers, we are what's called dual status employees. You're a W-2 employee for income tax purposes, but you are self-employed for social security purposes. And guess what? You want to be that way. The reason you want to be that way is because W-2 employees have access to tax-free fringe benefits like a 403B retirement plan that self-employed Schedule C per personnel do not get. You want to be a W-2 employee and because that gives you the ability for your church to give you uh, various fringe benefits at no cost to you uh, as an employee of the organization. Uh, the second thing is the congregation pays or reimburses for out-of-pocket medical expenses without establishing a proper plan. If you just turn in medical bills and they write you a check, uh, you're not doing it right, okay? Uh, there are several different ways that you can get tax-free reimbursements for medical expenses, but just writing you a check without a written plan to do that is not one of those. Uh, one of the things that churches sometimes do is they make payments to clergy investment accounts and they don't treat that as tax-free. What does that mean? You may have an investment account uh, uh, with, with money that normally would be taxed that the church just put you in a contrib contribution into that investment account. Well, that money has to be added back to your W-2. They can't just put money in an investment account for you without it being taxed. Uh, the congregation reimburses uh, clergy uh, personal commuting miles. Folks, the, the miles that you drive from your church to your home do not get reimbursed, only business-related mileage. And the business-related mileage rate for 2020 is 57 and a half cents per mile, up to. So your church can reimburse you any amount for business mileage, not commuting, up to 57 and a half cents a mile. FICA tax is deducted. I mentioned that in some cases, which is completely wrong. You just, you cannot do that. And uh, another one is re, re, reimbursing clergy expenses without adequate documentation. Uh, many a church administrator has been put in a difficult situation when a pastor has said, I spent so-and-so, write me a check. Well, you have to have receipts, folks, in order for it to be uh, reimbursable and not taxable to you. If the church gives you any cash allowances that you have access to and you do not have to account for them, every penny of that reimbursement it should go on your W-2 and box one is income to you. You want to file your taxes under a reimbursement system that says why, who, what, when, and where on your receipts uh, to justify uh, the amount that you're being reimbursed. I'm going to go over a few things uh, just just quickly that are that are questions that I hear. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot is is about bonuses or gifts, especially end of year gifts that churches want to give their pastor. And I hope that uh, many of you are blessed by end of the year gifts, Christmas gifts uh, from your church. Uh, but there's a way to handle that, and there's a way not to handle that. If people give money to a fund that is paid to you as a bonus of some kind. That is, is uh, as, I, as I said, this is the way that I say it. Uh, even though you're in church, there's no such thing as love when it comes to offerings. Okay? You hear the term, well, we're going to bless our pastor with a love offering. Wonderful. It's taxable, folks. Your love offering is taxable and to show up in box one on your W-2. Now, the way that people can avoid that and the church and you can avoid that is just having people give you a really nice Christmas card with a hundred dollar bill in it and say, I love you, pastor. They get no tax deduction, but you get the benefit of getting the gift from them. So if it comes through the church coffers though, it is, it is taxable. I don't know if any of you belong to, to a country club or an athletic club or anything, 
But if the church is paying for that and not putting your on, putting on your W-2, they can't do that. Uh, you can, the church can pay for Lions Club, Rotary, Kiwana, and those social type clubs, but they cannot pay for private uh, club memberships. Uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the 403B retirement plan in a minute. That is one of the greatest benefits that your church can give you if they, they do a retirement plan for you. We talked about the housing allowance. And one thing that I did not say earlier about the housing allowance is that you can exempt up or exclude, I should say, up to 100% of your compensation uh, as ministerial housing allowance. Did you hear that? Up to 100%. Now, if it's not within those criteria that we mentioned previously, you're still going to have to bring it back on to your 1040 and pay tax on it. But the church cannot tell you how much. You are the one that tells the church in writing how much that you want them to approve in a resolution uh, for the coming year. And then it, between you and the Internal Revenue Service in justifying the amount or else paying taxes on it. All right. I hope that many of your churches provide you with health insurance uh, in some fashion uh, because the Affordable Care Act is sometimes called the Obamacare uh, that was passed a number of years ago. Uh, it changed the way that uh, insurance was done through employers. Uh, the only way that's fully uh, tax exempt as a fringe benefit uh, is as group insurance, group insurance. If you have an individual policy a health sharing arrangement or any other type of arrangement that the church is paying you for, unless that is done through a special arrangement called a section 125 cafeteria plan and you're reimbursed for it, then you have to pay federal income tax and social security on that reimbursement. Now, if you do it through the cafeteria plan arrangement that I mentioned, uh, which has to be formally designed, then those, even those uh, payments potentially uh, can be exempted from income tax. But group and health insurance is a great benefit that you can provide for your folks. I would give a, an unpaid solicitation or an advertisement for Guidestone, uh, which is our retirement uh, unit as, as uh, Southern Baptist, in that both their individual plans and their group plans both qualify as group coverage because they are a self-insured plan. It's not inexpensive, but it meets the criteria to be a tax exempt benefit, regardless of whether you're under their individual plans or if you have a group plan through Guidestone. Uh, I don't know of any other place that you can go and get that benefit with an individual plan. Because if you just go out to Cigna or Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield and buy an individual plan and just directly get reimbursed by your church, that is a taxable benefit. One thing I, I would mention just quickly, many of you may not know about this, uh, is that if you're buying a house and you just don't have enough cash really to make the down payment, your church can loan you up to $10,000 without interest. Did you know that? You may think, well, gosh, we can't use the church's money for that. Well, if it's properly designed, your church can loan you up to $10,000 uh, for, for money necessary to buy a house with repayment plans. If it's over 10,000, they actually have to impute interest uh, and charge it uh, according to whatever the market will bear. The other thing that I would mention is, is that uh, moving expenses uh, used to be completely reimbursable. But if you move and you have a $10,000 move and the church reimburses you for it, guess where that's gonna end up now under the current tax law? It's gonna end up when your W-2 is a taxable item to you on box one in your form 1040. And no, no longer can you exclude it either. How about that? Isn't that great? And so uh, moving expenses have radically changed under the current tax law. All of you know that you use a Schedule C for your weddings, funerals, and those kind of things. Uh, so uh, be sure and report those kind of things separately on your Schedule C. Retirement or farewell, farewell gifts, uh, those are taxable. But let me, let me go ahead and, and drop something in here. I mentioned that you may have some golden nuggets today. If you have served your church for a long time and your church wants to honor you in retirement, are you ready for this? They can provide you 
with housing, like in a parsonage, or they can provide you with a housing cash allowance in recognition of previous year service as a totally tax-free benefit. So if you pastor your church for 30 or 40 years and they want to show you a lot of love in retirement, they can actually give you a cash allowance or give you the use of a house, not a house, but the use of a house in retirement uh, to benefit you when you retire. It's a very unique uh, scenario that uh, mo most churches don't take advantage of, but it's something that is out there. Now, some of your churches uh, feel your pain when you have to pay the two parts of the Social Security, the 7.65 for employee and employer, the 15.3. Your church can reimburse you for any portion of that that they want. Any portion of that they can, they can share with you and they can pay you back for that up to any amount that they want actually. But if they do that, that allowance for that Social Security has to be added back as an additional income item on your W-2. I hope many of your churches help you pay that 7.65 that the, the employer pays for everybody that's non-minister. But if they don't, that is an option, but it is taxable. Uh, if by church, by chance, the church does provide you with a vehicle and you get personal use out of it, uh, you do have to declare uh, income tax on the personal use of the vehicle, or if they just give you one, there's another option, it's called a lease option, that can be added also back to your W-2. So there are a lot of potential fringe benefits, and interestingly enough, under the Internal Revenue Code, uh, every fringe benefit, including group health insurance, uh, is completely taxable unless it's excluded. So group insurance is taxable, but it's not taxable because it's excluded specifically by, by the Internal Revenue Code. Okay? That makes sense? Okay, let's see in that first section if, there, if there's anything else. Uh, again, if your church gives you a uh, what we would call a contingency fund for ministerial expenses, pastor expenses. If you don't have to provide receipts for that, or if you do provide receipts for part of it, but you can take the difference in cash, every penny of that allowance is subject to income tax. Okay, so the best thing you can do is have a, a, a reimbursable uh plan a business of what's called an accountable reimbursement plan. If you don't know what that is, churchexcel.org that I mentioned to you has a policy on there for a business reimbursement plan. Um, the group insurance, as I mentioned, is, is a great benefit. Uh, and if your employees contribute some money towards the group coverage, if your church doesn't pay for all of it, unless you have a section 125 cafeteria plan that they can take that money out tax exempt. They can exclude it from their income. If you don't have a section 125 that has to come out after tax for your employees portion and they have to pay income tax on it. So you may want to investigate a section 125 cafeteria plan uh, if you have, especially if you have a larger staff because it gives options to, to the employer and the employee by not, not having that being the case. You're being able to take money out. Now, let me just mention about the 403B uh, contributions. That's something that uh, is a huge benefit for us as ministers. That, that is the same category as a 401K, as a traditional individual retirement account. Uh, most of your employers are not going to do this, but in 2020, between your employer and yourself, you can put in up to $57,000 tax deferred, not tax exempt, but tax deferred, okay? As an employee under age 50, that portion of that that you can have salary deferred uh, through your paycheck, it's taken out of your check, paid to somebody like Guidestone is $19,500. And then you can add another $6,500 to that if you're over age 50, in other words, $26,000 a year can be excluded by salary reduction. Here's another golden nugget, folks. You ready for this one? 
First of all, let me say, you can only do salary reduction for your 403B plan if you have salary. So any of your income that is ministerial housing allowance does not count for this. So if you have a $50,000 salary and you declare 25,000 as housing allowance, you only have 25,000 left that you can use for salary reduction towards your 403B plan. That would be a discouragement to declare 100% as housing allowance if you wanna take advantage of this benefit. Uh, but that's, that's something that, that you, you wanna take advantage of if you can. Now here, here's the golden nugget. Any money that is salary reduced from your paycheck is completely exempt from the 15.3% and tax deferred on federal income tax when it goes in. So if you have $20,000, let's say, taken out of your check and paid into Guidestone, the 15.3% self-employment tax that you would otherwise have to pay on that income as salary goes away. And it never raises its head again, because guess what? When you take that money out in retirement, you want to take it out as ministerial housing allowance, and you don't pay Social Security or income tax either one when it comes out and it's used for ministerial housing expenses. Folks, that is a sweet, sweet arrangement. And that is something that a lot of ministers do not know, do not realize. Your regular non-ordained W-2 employees in your church don't get that full benefit. They pay social security when that money is deducted and goes into their 403B. They get to defer the income tax, but they have to pay the income tax when it comes out. Those of us as ministers, don't pay any tax going in. If you declare it in retirement as housing allowance, you don't pay any tax at all coming out. That is a sweet deal. Uh, that, that, that's the worst, worth the price of admission today for you being on this call. Uh, so if you're not doing that and you need to talk about the technicalities of it, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll walk you through that. Okay. There's lots of other benefits that your employer can provide for you. For instance, another fringe benefit uh, is your church can provide up to $50,000 of group health insurance for you, completely tax-free. That's not a lot of money in today's world, but if you want to provide uh, this benefit for your church staff, you can pay for up to $50,000 of group life insurance for them, and it's a totally tax-free benefit. It's a business expense for your church. Now, if the policy is more than $50,000, you can still provide it, but the Internal Revenue Service requires that there's a factor, a table that they use to, to include a value for the value over 50,000 has to be added back to the W-2. So life insurance is a very valid option. Another one is the, the educational allowance. Uh, big corporations like, uh, like for instance, uh, Lockheed have an, an educational allowance for, for undergraduate or graduate uh, education that a $5,250 is completely tax-free. That's a nice deal for people that work for Lockheed and companies that offer this. If there's a downside to this is that if you have that type of offering, you have to offer it to everybody in your church and your church that, that's an employee. You may not want to do that. But an option for churches that don't want to do that is that you can, you can have a working condition for educational fringe benefit that you can actually pay for education for your staff members that leads to a degree as long as it doesn't qualify them for a new job or qualify them for the minimal requirements for their current job. So if you wanna provide some type of educational benefits uh, for your folks, that is an option that is out there. Uh, flexible spending account. I, I suspect that some of you may have one of these. Uh, this is one of those options like that you're, you're, you and your employer both can contribute to. Uh, it's $2,750 annual maximum uh, between you and your employer. The, the flexible uh, spending account, uh, the downside of it is if you don't spend it, you lose it. Let me explain that. If you, if you put some of your own money that's, that's taken out of your paycheck into the flexible spending account and your employer puts some in, it's available to you until 1231 in many cases with a slight carryover depending on the plan until March of the next year, maybe another $500 or so. But if you don't use it in that time frame, it's going away, including 
the money that was taken out of your check. All right. So for that reason, unless you think you're going to spend it, you probably won't, don't want to do it. There's actually three different kinds of flexible spending accounts. One of them is very limited, mostly. What most people use is for prescription eyewear and for dental. That's what they usually spend it for because most health insurance policies don't cover those things. And there are folks that have FSAs specifically for that type of arrangement. Uh, one of them is dependent care. And one of them is actually, if you don't have any other insurance, this is better than nothing because anything that can be covered by insurance can be covered by an FSA plan if it's the only health arrangement that you have. So FSA might be a, an option for some of you. Uh, one of the things that I really like is, is uh, called, you see it on the listing there, is a health savings account. Uh, it, is a, uh, it, it, is, it is different in, the, in the, the, the fact that it has to be paired with a high deductible health plan. It, let me say it again, has to be paired with a high deductible health plan. And what that means in 2020, uh, your minimum deductible has to be at least $2,800 for a family and your maximum out of pocket has to be $13,800. There are things like deductibles or copays or prescriptions and things that may not be paid through your regular high deductible health plan, uh, especially the deductible amount you can pay those through a health savings arrangement, a health savings account. Uh, it's up to $7,100 a year for a family. I mean, that's quite a bit of money. Your employer can contribute to it. You can contribute to it. And guess what? If mom and dad want to contribute to your HSA, they can do that. That money uh, stays in your account until it's used up for qualified medical expenses. You may want to write down IRS publication 502, which is a listing of all the medications and expenses that can be covered by an HSA. And HSA folks can actually be inherited. <laughs> it, it, go, it never goes away. If you have not spent that when you and your wife pass away and it's a family HSA, it actually goes on to your heirs and they have to pay tax on it when it comes out. Uh, another negative, if there is a negative, is that you cannot contribute to the plan after age 65. You can only contribute to the HSA up until age 65. You can, uh, you can set one of these up, your employer can set one up that you can contribute to, or you can set one up for yourself and contribute to it in after-tax dollars, which you can then adjust off of your tax return to get the tax benefit back, back to you, okay? So you can set one of these up yourself if you have a high deductible health plan. Now, uh, the other option, <clears throat> excuse me, is a health reimbursement arrangement. This is what some employers use to uh, pay, especially deductibles for high deductible plans that, that the employees would otherwise have to pay. You can set up a health reimbursement arrangement, and it is an amount of money that is actually uh, belongs to your employer. It doesn't belong to you. And if it's not spent, then you don't get to use it because it's actually it's an employer fund that the money is paid out of, uh, and it's mainly to cover uh, deductibles and, and co-pays, those kind of things that your plan doesn't cover. But that is actually set up by your employer. And all of these folks have to be uh, formal written plans. Okay. There are organizations out there uh, like People Keep, Zane Benefits, uh, Benefit Concepts. There are a lot of what are called TPAs, third party administrators in the marketplace, that that's all they do is help employers write plans and then help you administer those plans. Whether it's a flexible spending account, a health reimbursement arrangement, a health savings account. They will help you administer those plans. There's a small monthly fee and an original setup fee for doing that, uh, but that is something that is an option uh, if you want to provide that benefit for your folks. And it is very appreciated because if you have a high deductible plan and the deductible for the family is $2,800, that means they're paying that up front before they get much benefit out of it. And you can use one of these plans to pay that and take care of that on their behalf. The uh, Qualified uh, Small Employer Health Reimbursement Arrangement. It's called a CACERA. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that. 
Uh, that's something that came into in existence in, in 2017. Let me just say in a nutshell what this involves. For, for uh, uh, a married family or a family with children, you can give an employee up to $10,600 for buying an individual policy, for paying co-pays, prescriptions, all those kind of things. And that way you don't have to have a group policy for your church. I do know a few churches that are actually doing this since it came in in 2017. And that way you know what your budget amount is up front for your health costs for your church. In other words, you can give up to anything up to $10,600 for a family for them to meet their medical expenses. And then your church doesn't have to have any insurance plans. They go out and buy their own product in the marketplace. And it's a great way to control your budget as far as, as healthcare costs are concerned. Another one that I'll mention just uh, quickly uh, is called an ICRA, I-C-H-R-A. Those came into effect in 2020. Uh, those are individual coverage, health reimbursement arrangements. And those also have a great deal of flexibility in being set up, but your, em, your employees can only benefit from those if they have an individual insurance policy, an individual insurance policy, okay? So the CACERA and the ICRA are things that you might want to consider that you might want to look at as, as possibilities, okay? All right, let's look at some tax credits. Th this is the meat of, meat of the stuff right here. And I, I, I just need to take a sort of a poll. Can, can I have another 10 minutes or so? Okay, hang with me. Uh, I, th I think it's gonna be worth it. The credits are three different kinds. They're refundable credits, they're non-refundable credits, and they're partially refundable credits. Let me tell you what that means. Uh, if it's refundable, those are those are the gold mine accounts, those the credits, those are the ones that you really want to take advantage of if you can. What does that mean? Refundable means that the US government, the US Treasury, will allow you, <coughs> will allow you to apply that tax credit against any tax that you owe. If it's not refundable, you can only apply a tax towards your federal income tax obligation. And you're still out in the cold on your self-employment social security. But if it's a refundable credit, you can apply that against any tax that you owe, mainly social security and federal income tax. So you want to take advantage and get to the refundable uh, credit category if you can. All right. Does that make sense? All right. Let's look at a few of those, a child tax credit. If you have children that are under 17 at the end of 2020, in other words, they're 16, up to 16 years of age, uh, by the end of 2020, you can take the child tax credit for them. And it's, it's an initial uh, $600 that can be applied towards your federal income tax. And then many people can get an additional $1,400 for those children up to age 16 that, that is refundable. In other words, you can apply that to your social security or your income tax. So if you got children in that category, uh, you probably wanna look at IRS publication 972, IRS publication 972. And uh, uh, Becky reminded me, please go ahead and, and continue to put the questions in the chat as we go along, because that'll be the basis of what we do at one o'clock. But if you have children in that category and you're not taking that credit, uh, you're, you're losing a tremendous benefit. And uh, so, so do that. Another one is, is the dependent tax credit. Uh, if you have an, especially if you have uh, older children between 17 and 23 that, that are say college students, or if you have an elderly relative that lives with you, uh, you may be able to take a dependent credit for up to $500 on your taxes. It's non-refundable, but if you have an elderly parent that lives with you, that has very minimal income, they live with you throughout the year, they're a U.S. citizen, you may qualify for a dependent tax credit. That's one of them. Another one is the child and dependent uh, care tax credit. Um, 
this this is a credit for three thousand dollars for one child, six up to six thousand for your whole family. If you pay for child care uh, for for your children or for your other dependents that qualify, up to six thousand dollars a year for two or more children, uh, if you actually have that much expense. And so that and that's up through age thirteen. So if you have children that are thirteen or under. Uh, that may be a credit if you pay for child care. By the way, both spouses do have to work. Uh, you can't have one stay at home and, and send the kids to nursery during the day. Uh, both of them have to be uh, earning an income and, and paying income tax on that. Uh, the next one is the uh, re retirement savings credit. Retirement savings credit is, is a non-refundable credit, but uh, many people won't qualify for this, but I'll just tell you what it is. Um, on the AGI, the Form 1040 uh, is, is where you take that on line 11. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, let me qualify that. AGI, which is line 11 on your Form 1040, is the basis for this retirement savings credit. And I'm just going to give you some categories. Uh, it can be up to $4,000 if you're married filing jointly, but your income has to be pretty low. It's either 50%, 20%, or 10%. For instance, uh, the maximum uh, in 2020 to get the 50% credit is $39,000. So your line 11 on your 1040 has to be $39,000 or less. I hope most of you are not in that category uh, so that you wouldn't qualify for the retirement savings credit to an individual retirement account. Uh, and it uh, is completely phased out at 66,000. But if you do contribute to a traditional IRA uh, and you think you might qualify based on those lower income levels, that is a credit that's, op, uh, uh, that's available to you. The other one is the, the educational credits, the American uh, Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit, uh, the, what they call the AOTC, the American Opportunity uh, Tax Credit, uh, uh, is, is the one that used to be, it was blended with what used to be called the HOPE Credit was blended into that. Some of you may have taken the whole credit. It's designed uh, to be a credit for the first four years of college after high school. And so if you have a child that fits in that category uh, that, that is dependent on your tax return, uh, it's up to $2,500 a year. It's 100% of the first 2,000 and 25% of the next 2,000. So that's a credit, folks. That's a dollar for dollar credit. And it, it is partially refundable, potentially. Uh, the other one is the lifetime learning credit that any of us at any age can take advantage of. Isn't that neat? That uh, you, can, you can take the credit. is 20% of the first $10,000 of out-of-pocket expenses. But again, it's non-refundable. But if you're studying in <coughs> some fashion and not being reimbursed by your employer and you're, you have out-of-pocket expenses, you can take the lifetime learning credit. Uh, and you need to be able to to do that. So I would encourage you to do it. <clears throat> the, the next one is the earned income credit. The EIC is, is a refundable credit. Uh, I'll just give you some, some categories uh, for the earned income credit. You have to have a pretty low income. But uh, if you have no children, the maximum credit is $538 for adjusted gross income up to $21,710. So again, I hope that you don't have income that low, uh, but uh, you can get a little bit. The top end is $6,660 uh, with three children or more if your income is up to 57,000. There are ministers that may actually qualify for that. It's called the earned income credit. And guess what folks, it's one of those refundable credits. You can apply that credit to any tax obligation uh, that you have. You may want to read about that on, in IRS publication 596, 596. Uh, that's a great credit for ministers that don't earn quite as much. And I'll just mention this one uh, quickly, the adoption tax credit. Uh, we have a surprising number of ministers that adopt children every year and, and we congratulate them on that. There is an adoption ta tax credit of up to $14,300 per child. So if you're thinking about adoption, folks, uh, that is a great credit. Uh, if you don't need the credit, it's non-refundable if you don't need it in the current year to meet your income tax obligation, but you can carry it forward for, for an additional five years to tax obligations. In most credits, that's not the case. This is the only credit 
that's one of those that you can carry forward. You can use it against the current year and then carry it forward. And guess what? The adoption expense is also a reimbursable expense from your employer if your, your employer has an adoption reimbursement policy up to $14,300. So if you're a larger church and want to offer that benefit across the board to your folks, uh, I would encourage you to maybe put that in your policy and uh, make it something that, that is available to your folks that many won't take advantage of, but some of, some of them uh, just might take advantage of. I, I think I would be uh, deficient in what I'm commenting, not to say on all of these fringe benefits, be sure that they, they meet the non-discrimination requirements. If you want to set up a health savings account or a flexible spending or an education benefit or an adoption credit benefit, you need to be sure that you don't discriminate just for certain people on your staff. At the minimum, you need to be consistent within a class. For instance, if you're going to offer a working condition fringe benefit for education for, for your ministerial staff, you can do that being consistent within the class, but it means that everyone that's minister gets the same benefit. The pastor doesn't get it and the others get excluded. If you're going to offer it to your, your W-2 ordinary non-ordained ministers, you have to offer that benefit to everybody that's in that class. So you don't get to pick and choose. You have to be consistent uh, within classes. The only other thing that I would mention uh, during this time is on page 109 uh, of the book of the Minister's Tax and Financial Guide. Uh, what I would say to you about that, there's a, an excellent countdown to retirement. I would say that if you're 55 or up, uh, you probably want to go to page 109 on that Minister's uh, Financial Guide and look at that. It is a great timetable on budget, how to set up your pension, taking Social Security, housing, what your medical insurance needs to look like. It's a great chart to help you think through uh, what your retirement might look like as you go into that. Okay, uh, just, I just mentioned that as, as, a, as a reference. Okay, uh, we're going to come back at one o'clock. If you have any more questions, please put them in the chat right now and let us have those. You can also drop a question uh, to me at Gary at TarrantBaptist.org. You can write a question to uh, front desk at TarrantBaptist.org. And uh, we will try to respond to those questions at one o'clock. One thing that I did not have time to do right now is to do a, a quick glance down through the Form 1040 and related schedules. I will do that at one o'clock. I'll take about 10 minutes of our time during the Q&A to go walk you through the 1040 and the attached schedules. Uh, the IRS was getting complaints for years about how long the Form 1040 was. And so they said, okay, we'll shorten it for you. And the way they shortened it was to turn it into two three quarter pages instead of one long back and front form and they added three additional schedules, okay? so. I'll just introduce you those uh, when, when we get to that point this afternoon. And, and uh, if you have any questions, we can take direct questions directly off of the 1040 conversation this afternoon and everything else that you're posting in the chat that you're gonna send us between now and one o'clock, we will make a valid effort to respond to those questions. And I would say again, uh, after this afternoon, uh, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to let me know uh, and I would be glad with any of you uh, after you have done your tax return, if you want me to help look it over and see if I see anything that you maybe didn't see, I would be glad to do that. I did with a lot of ministers last year. Uh, but uh, I, I would say this as, as a final remark. Uh, most of you, I assume, are, are filing your taxes digitally. You're using TurboTax, H&R Block, TaxSlayer, one of those. Uh, you can actually go to the Internal Revenue website at irs.gov and there are a bunch, I mean a lot of free file options. If your taxable income is up to $79,000, 
which might qualify a bunch of you because you have a ministerial housing allowance that reduces your overall income uh, up to 79,000. There's several of those that you can actually use their, their software package for free. And so you might want to check that out before you pay 40, 50 or $60 to the TurboTax and, uh, and check that out at, at uh, the free file on the irs.gov website. One final comment that I don't need to make any other year, but I'm going to make it this year is if you didn't get your rebate check, either one of them or both of them, you can claim them on your 2020 tax return. There's some folks for whatever reason were entitled to a, a rebate check, a stimulus check and did not get it. If you're one of those folks, the IRS has given you an opportunity to claim <clears throat> there's a recovery option on your 2020 tax return. And they will, when you claim it, they will compare it to the checks that they've already distributed it. And if you're trying to double dip, guess what? They're not gonna give you the credit, uh, but you can claim it on your 2020 tax return, okay? Has everybody had a chance to enter your questions? Have you done that pretty much? Okay, man, you have been a great audience. I hope that that was helpful. I hope you got a few golden nuggets that, that will make money for you, so to speak, that you may not have known about before. And I promise you the one to two o'clock hour, if you'll take the time to come back to that, it's gonna be rich. Uh, you guys yourselves have uh, provided most of the content for that. And uh, we'll have a dialogue. Uh, Frank Palos is also on this call. Uh, Frank is a tax practitioner uh, and works for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. And, and we'll allow Frank to speak, speak into the conversation this afternoon if he wants to. Uh, I do not do tax returns. Do not ask me to do your tax return, okay? I'll answer questions about it all day long. I am a CPA, but I am not a registered firm tax practitioner. So what you're getting is what you're paying for. It's nothing. Uh, as far as if it's just information, if you didn't pay for it. Okay. But uh, we can direct you to Frank or other tax practitioners to do your tax return for you. If you don't want to do it for yourself. Okay. Anything else, Becky, that we need to do before we sign off right now? The link, the link for the one o'clock is in the constant contact that you got this morning. Uh, it's the first link is the one you're on now. The second link is in the lower part of that email that you got this morning. I uh, hope as many of you as can will come back this afternoon and we're going to have more fun than we did in this hour. Okay. Take care. Oh, Gary. Yes. You might tell about PSK, their, their cost, the PSK, what you found from them. Yes. PSK accounting, which is a CPA firm that we use. Our understanding is they have a set fee of $300 for ministers tax returns. Uh, typically uh, many CPA firms would charge $500 up for a minister's tax return, uh, but they have a, no matter the complication level of your return, if you have investments and other things, uh, they have a maximum tax cost of $300 for preparation, which is probably a, a decent deal in today's market, but their, their partners just want to minister uh, to, to folks, to ministers in a way, and, and they're specialists in doing minister's tax returns. I know many of you probably have your own folks that do that, and I hope you do. Uh, but uh, when people ask me, who should I get to do my tax return? I tell them that I don't want my general practitioner doing brain surgery on me. You don't want someone that doesn't understand minister's taxes doing your minister's tax return because it's so specialized. So at the minimum, find someone uh, that knows how to do minister's taxes because there's a lot of folks out there that don't. Okay, but PSK Accounting can help you. Uh, Frank Palos that's on this call that I mentioned can help you. And we've got a other, couple others that we could recommend to you. Okay, see you at one. Take care. Bye.